Alliance in San Francisco that I founded in 2004 specifically to assist victims of crime petition for their immigration status. Uh, most of the clients we see at ICWIC are from Mexico and Central America, and they came in undocumented without a visa. And so a lot of the references that I'm going to be making are going to be to those immigrants. Um, probably the toughest, the toughest part of doing this work is the emotional component. I tell everybody that comes to ICWIC looking for a job or, or to volunteer that that's, that's the most challenging part about the work. It is we see victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, kidnapping, false imprisonment, regularly. Um, incest, you know, a father, uh, a biological father raping his four-year-old daughter, you know, for ongoing basis. And it's tough. It's really, really tough. We have a lot of tears in our office. And unfortunately, this is how they qualify for the law. So this is what we need to highlight um, are their terrible, terrible stories. And reading these terrible stories day after day can get pretty challenging. Um, the flip side to that is that 99.9% .9 of our cases are approved and we're handing out green cards and work permits to these women and we get tears of joy when that happens, a lot of them. So if you couldn't decide whether to go to law school or get a master's in social work, this, this, this might be a good, a good fit for you. Today I'm going to talk about U, um, applications for U non-immigrant status, the U visa. Um, there are a number of different options for victims, but that's the one I'm going to focus on today. Immigrants, uh, undocumented immigrants face unique challenges in, in coming to the United States. Most of them come in from cultures where domestic violence is accepted and if they have ever attempted to call the police in their own countries, the police have come and said this is a family matter and you shouldn't be calling the police. Occasionally, if they end up in the hospital or if it's a very serious incident, police, there could be police involvement. But when they come to the U.S., they think that I, I can't call the police because it's, it's, they don't really know that it's a crime. And if they do find out that it is a crime um, and they get the courage to call the police, they're afraid because they're, they're afraid of being deported. And they think that, you know, like I said, most of them are here illegally and that the police are going to come and, and the abuser is going to say, she's undocumented and, and they're going to take her away as well. And also language barriers. About 90% of the victims that we see at my office are monolingual Spanish speakers. And in Los Angeles, we have more and more law enforcement agencies that speak Spanish, but I think as the immigrants um, are spreading out across the country, you know, the, the, that's not as, as quickly happening with the law enforcement officers and agencies. There are two steps um, generally to gain your immigration status. The first step is that a petition needs to be filed, either a self-petition or a petition by somebody else that shows you're eligible for immigration. And one of the most common ways is through a family petition. Um, you can apply for your spouse, your children, your siblings, um, one of the problems with this for abused immigrants is that this petition can be used to control the immigrant. The husband will refuse to apply for the immigrant status because he'll, he says if you ever call, he wants to keep her undocumented and keep her in this disempowered state so he can threaten her. If you ever call the police, you know, I'll have you deported and you'll never see your children again. Also, uh, you can have a petition filed for, uh, by an employer you can do an asylum case, or there are a number of special visa categories, like the diversity visa, which is 50,000 random lottery visas for people around the world, or the U visa, which we're going to talk about today. The second step applying for your immigration status is um, 
applying for your actual permanent residency. And does everybody understand what the permanent residency is? That's lawful permanent residency, and that's basically what everybody wants is a path to residency. And there are a number of problems with the application for permanent residency. Um, when it happens, some, you know, some family petitions have multi-year waiting lists. If you're married to a legal permanent resident from Mexico, the wait is five years. If you apply for your sibling from the Philippines, your wait can be 23 years. Um, and there are no, in the way the law stands currently, there are no interim benefits like work authorization for these, for these um, immigrants. And also, where you apply for your status is important. Most people immigrating from Mexico and Central America come in without a valid visa, and they must leave the country to process their paperwork. Um, the people that did come in with a visa can process their paperwork here in the United States, but if you came in without a visa, then you need to return to your home country. And that can be very difficult. It can be risky because you don't know if your, your waiver for coming in undocumented in the first place is going to get approved. And it also can be expensive. And it can take a really long time. And so people that have families here and children in school don't want to leave... <laughs> don't want to leave their family for two years in some flux situation. I'm going to go back to El Salvador and let hope and pray that my, my petition gets great, granted. Um, the other issue is eligibility. Immigrants need to prove that they are admissible to become residents in, in, in the United States, and that means that they have no crim immigration or criminal violations. And also one of those... Um, elements of eligibility is that they're not likely to become a public charge, which means that they're not likely to go on welfare, which means you need to prove a certain financial um, viability. And so it's very difficult for low-income immigrants to overcome these requirements. There are a number of different forms of immigration relief for survivors of domestic violence. The Violence Against Women Act is one of them, and that's called VAWA, and that is for victims of domestic violence who are married to U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents. And the victim needs to prove that it was a good faith marriage, meaning she didn't enter it for immigration purposes only. There's also the VTVPA, which is the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act, which encompasses both the U visa and the T visa law, gender-related asylum, and special immigrant juvenile status, which is a law for abandoned, abused, neglected children who are under the jurisdiction of a juvenile court. Um, you need a court order from the juvenile court, which can be either an adoption court, a guardianship court, a dependency court, or a um, delinquency court, stating that reunification with the parent is not viable due to abandonment, abuse, or neglect, and um, that it's not in the child's best interest to return to the home country. So today I'm gonna focus on the U visa. The main purposes of the U visa were to assist law enforcement, and that's, that's really what it's all about. It is about oiling the wheels of the criminal justice system um, to encourage undocumented victims to come forward and report these crimes. There's also the humanitarian component to help the victims. The benefits of the U visa law or you get legal status for four years and with that comes employment authorization and getting a social security number and a driver's license which I'm not sure what the driver's license laws are in Oregon but you can't get one in California if you if you don't have if you don't have the social security number and the work authorization so it's, it's huge, uh, it's huge to be able to drive your kids to school and drive to work without being, you know, fear of getting caught. 
You also possible, it's also possible to adjust your status, which means apply for your permanent residency after three years. And like I said earlier, this is what all, all immigrants want, is a path to residency. You're eligible for public benefits. As soon as you apply for the U visa, you can receive public benefits, which means cash aid, food stamps, Medi-Cal for, for yourself. Um, and also, if you're in deportation proceedings or removal proceedings, as they're called now, you're able to terminate those proceedings, which is, which is quite good. You can also apply for your derivative beneficiaries, which means your close family members. You can apply for your spouse, your children, your parents and siblings in certain situations. Um, the U visa law was created in 2000, and there was near unanimous passage of the U visa law. Um, we had no regulations for the law until 2007, which meant for and still makes for a very interesting practice of this law because there was a lot of things that were not determined and we were still out there doing cases because they gave us an option to do interim relief cases for, for victims during those years. Um, there is a 10,000 cap on the number of principal applicants. I think that no one ever thought that, that we would reach this cap. With T visas, there is a 5,000 cap, and they never get anywhere close to, to that cap with the T visas. Last year with the U visa, we, we met the 10,000 cap, and I think that the more and more people that know about the UESA, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be met earlier and earlier each year. The main requirements for a UESA is you need to be a victim of a designated crime, helpful to the law enforcement. The law enforcement must certify the helpfulness. The victim can't unreasonably refuse to help. The victim must suffer substantial abuse as a result of the crime, and that can be either physical or emotional abuse. And then you need to be admissible or eligible for a waiver. This is a list, uh, a partial list of the U visa crimes. It includes a lot of cases we see in our office are rape, incest, domestic violence, <clears throat> sexual assault, um, false imprisonment, kidnapping, and a couple of murder and manslaughter cases as well. Um, the victim cannot be culpable of the crime they're applying under. So if there's a mutually aggressive fight between, between spouses and they both beat each other up and the woman is, was, is a victim, I mean is culpable of the crime, she cannot get a U visa. In most of the cases, even if, I mean, if a woman reacts in self-defense, that's, that's a different story. And in a lot of the police reports, you know, it, it says we determined that suspect was the primary aggressor, and that won't affect the victim. But if the victim has committed the, the crime as well, then, then she can't apply. The two most important factors in the U visa are first, that the applicant is or was helpful in the investigation of the crime. The applicant needs to have information of the crime, which they all do because they're the victim, and either was or is or is likely to be helpful in the investigation or prosecution of the crime and also that she has or will not unreasonably refuse um, assistance in the future. So this, this um, has, is a, a requirement for continued cooperation. So if a victim reports the incident and then she recants her story and says, oh no, that didn't happen and I'm not gonna go to court and I'm not gonna testify, then, then she's out of luck. There have been a couple cases that we've ended up winning in very uh, serious circumstances where she reported the crime, it, it was an attempted murder crime, she reported it, she, she went to court, she testified multiple times in court, 
but then finally at the end she recanted the story and so that was on her certification we'll talk about later the the DA wrote that she recanted her story and immigration said well she can't get it she recanted the story and then we did multiple declarations from the client and witnesses and, and therapists saying that she was living with the abuser's family, they were threatening her, um, that she had to drop the charges, and, and they ended up approving that case. But these, this is very tricky. If you're reading a police report and you see didn't want to prosecute, you're, you're facing an uphill battle. They, I mean, they really want you to continue, um, help with the cooperation. The second most uh, important factor is the substantial abuse. Um, use, the Immigration Service will analyze the nature, severity, and duration of the injury, the harm suffered, including aggravation <coughs> of existing conditions or a pattern of abuse. This is very important because this means that we can bring in the history of the domestic violence into the harm suffered. Many, many times women are victims for years and years of abuse, but then that last incident that they report is, is a one-hit incident. And so you look at the police report and it says no visible injuries, and it, it really minimizes the incident. And this is where we can bring in past injuries. You know, he, he previously he broke her nose, he pushed her down. We get counselor's letters, you know, we get, we get witness letters, and the declaration from the client is huge. They also look at the seriousness of the perpetrator's conduct and the seriousness of harm to appearance, health, physical or mental soundness. And again, that's where we get to bring in the mental health evaluations, which are very important in most of these cases. The first, the first step um, in doing a U visa case is getting your law enforcement agency certification. Your, the U visa case cannot go forward unless you have a signature from your law enforcement agency stating that your, your victim was a victim and she was helpful in the prosecution. Um, mostly in our cases, it's the, it's the DA or the police that are signing the certifications, but also some other agencies can sign the certifications like Child Protective Services, which, which, is, which is really good. Um, the EEOC, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Labor can also sign certifications. Um, the problem is, is that there are some anti-immigrant law enforcement agencies that def develop re very restrictive policies on how and when they're going to sign these certifications. Um, unfortunately, there is no mandate in the law for the law enforcement agencies to sign the certification. So, it's up to them. Um, fortunately, in Los Angeles, we have um, some of the major law enforcement agencies like the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office and Los Angeles Police Department are on board with the U visa and they understand, you know, so many immigrants live in, in their communities and they understand how important this is to, for, for investigation and prosecution of crimes. So, because of some of these policies, like for instance, Santa Ana PD has a policy where they will only sign the certification if the case is open, which some of these domestic violence crimes are, are, are prosecuted in one week and they're closed. And so, I, you know, there's not a big window for the victims, the victims to apply and get their cert signed. So, we spend a lot of our time um, educating law enforcement agencies. And we tell them that the law was intended to oil the wheels of the crim criminal justice system. That this law is for them. It's, you know, it's, it's for the victims too, but it's, it's for them. Um, the legislative intent says that it's okay for past crimes. The law was intentionally written with multiple tenses to include past crimes. Um, it was passed so the immigrants can develop a sense of trust with the law enforcement so they can feel comfortable um, and come forward. The other, pr the other problem is that the law enforcement agencies sometimes think that their signature is going to give the victim a U visa. And we need to tell them that's not true. There's an entire application packet that goes to the, the immigration service, in including 
criminal background checks, medical records, counselor's letters, and so we just need to make sure that they know that. So derivative beneficiaries may also get a U visa. This is a list of, of who you can apply for. Um, your spouse, children, parents, siblings, either inside or outside of the United States. Um, but the law is very clear that the victim is, is not able to apply for the abuser. Um, in some people's minds, they think that perhaps a lot of fraud could be going on with the U visa and the couples are planning it together to, you know, they're good, let's plan this incident and, and, and go forward. You'll get your papers, then you can apply for me. Yes. Waiver is immigrants need a forgiveness for their bad marks that, they, that they've had. So criminal violations, previous immigration violations. So that's one of the components to filing for the U visa case is, is to file the waiver. So if they've been previously removed, for example, that would be one that you would have to waive. Correct, correct. I'm going to talk more about the waivers um, in a little bit more, in more detail. So the U visa is a confidential application with the Immigration Service. The abuser is never asked his side of the story. Um, there is no hearing and there is no interview. There are paper petitions submitted with the Immigration Service. The Vermont Service Center, which is one of the uh, offices of the Immigration Service, they have sole jurisdiction to adjudicate all U visa cases. Um, so their paper petitions filed. If they want more evidence, they send us a request for evidence, and we get more evidence and send it in. So that's very comforting for, for a lot of victims, that there, it's not like a restraining order hearing um, or a criminal court proceeding that they need to worry about facing the abuser or what his side of the story is. Um, the applicant must use their own address but they can designate a safe address, which is our office, so all, no correspondence will ever go to the abuser or, or an unsafe place. Um, and if the case is denied, we've only had one denial, um, if the case is denied, they do not refer the, the victim to the immigration police, to ICE. So that's also very com comforting for the victims because you know most people that come to my office, they're, they're so afraid for all their victim reasons and their immigrant reasons, and they're just like, I don't want to do it because I'm going to get deported. And we comfort them that you will not get deported, even, even if your case gets denied. The application packet for the principal includes the 918, which is the main form, the Supplement B, which is the law enforcement certification, the I-192, which is the waiver, and eligibility evidence and, and the fee, or a fee waiver, which the fee waiver is very important in our case because we serve low-income Im immigrants, and the Vermont Service Center who adjudicates our cases grants every single fee waiver. So unlike the rest of immigration, it's kind of hard to get the fee waiver granted. It's, it's, it's easy. So the evidence standard that we have for the U visa case is any credible evidence, which is a great standard because we can submit absolutely anything we want to. And the, the weaker your case is, the more evidence you can submit. And the more backup docs you're going to want to submit, um, declarations, witness declarations, photos. If you have a very strong incident where, some, you know, where your abuser stabbed the woman and she went to the hospital and he was prosecuted and convicted, you basically have to submit those documents, and, then, and that's enough. But with the weaker cases, like I said, these one-hit cases, there's got to be a lot of backup documents explaining how she suffered substantial abuse. The law requires that the principal applicant, applicant submits a declaration that states what the crime was, how the applicant was helpful, and how she suffered substantial abuse. Um, you need to look over your documents, and any documents that suggest non-cooperation, you need to thoroughly explain that in your declaration. 
Uh, initially, I was afraid. He threatened to kill me if I called the police. But then, in the end, I went two weeks later, and I went to the police, and I told them I wanted him arrested, and, and he did en end up getting um, convicted. Additional evidence that we submit are police reports, subpoenas, other court records, medical records, eligibility documentation for victim services, mental health evaluations, and letters from witnesses about the crime. And like I said, the stronger the incident, the less backup docs you need. Um, but you're, you're, you're going to want to review all those things because sometimes you know, your criminal court disposition says um, victim didn't show up to testify. So you won't want to include that if, if, if you're submitting it. And you know, you're advocates. You're only submitting what is, you know, what's good for your clients. It's not like you're keep, you know, as long as you are honest. The application packet for the derivatives includes the um, 918 Supplement A, which is a petition filed by the principal for the derivative. Um, so if the principal does not want to petition for the derivative, then, then that derivative cannot get status. It has to be the principal that, that wants them to get status. This can sometimes get a little bit tricky um, with domestic violence. Um, a woman, you know, immigration cases take a long time to do. So women's people's lives change, and women meet new spouses. And unfortunately, um, we with the... Uh, the dynamics of domestic violence, sometimes the second spouse they choose isn't so great either. And they're petitioning for them, and they're in your office. And we've had a number of cases where the client has come crying to us and said, he did it too. And so it's important always to get consent of joint representation agreements signed when you have two adults doing, doing these cases, because you want to be very clear with that husband that you're not going forward with his case. And so you want him to know that at the beginning before things get started. Also, for the derivative packet, you need the waiver, the fee, or the fee waiver, and the application for employment authorization. So the, every, every immigrant needs a waiver for the bad marks that they have. And the U visa has a wonderful waiver provision that waives pretty much everything except for Nazi persecution and genocide. <laughs> it's, it's kind of unlike anything in immigration law. Um, and they can do anything, and it can be waived. It's, it's the magic U visa waiver. These are common grounds of inadmissibility or bad marks. The either entering without a visa, using false documents, s saying that you are a U.S. citizen, bringing, bringing in your undocumented children, which is referred to as alien smuggling, um, being previously removed or deported, crimes, and public charge which is the being on welfare is not an issue for the U visa. So we encourage all of our victims to get to get resources, welfare resources as soon as they can. Every waiver is discretionary and it's a balancing act of equities. The positive factors must outweigh the negative factors. Positive factors include hardship suffered and helpfulness. Um, and when the applicant does have negative factors, the immigration service loves contrition. They, they really do. I, it's amazing how far a declaration of, I'm sorry, I, I'll never do it again, they, they, they love them. And most, you know, most, of, most of the cases we see, they're not terrible crim records. They're petty thefts and, and minor, minor criminal incidents. Some of them you know, unfortunately, our, our child abuse, because they've been in this violent situation for 20 years, that, that it, it, some of it comes out in, in ways um, against the kids. Um, but they, we, have seen, we have seen some pretty bad stuff. The, I guess our clients 
our client's bad boy sons have sometimes had some, some pretty serious criminal records. You know, they also, they too, have grown up in this home of domestic violence. And, you know, it's not that uncommon for them to have some juvenile delinquency issues or worse when they're over 18 to have some, some criminal issues. So the more serious the violation, the more evidence required. If it's a simple coming in without a visa, we just submit the waiver application, the three-sentence declaration, and maybe the U.S. citizen uh, child birth certificates. But if they have some criminal, uh, criminal issues and some previous immigration histories, deportations, then we need to, we need to, we need to beef it up a little bit. Um, and in the waiver, you also need to show that the like it's in the national and public interest. That's the standard for the waiver, that it's in the national and public interest to grant this waiver and to forgive this immigrant. So the cooperation with the law enforcement is, is, is ways in that favor. The inadmissibility waivers for the derivatives uh, can be harder because there's no victimization or helpfulness. Um, you always want to say how the derivative helped in the investigation and how the derivative supports the principal's recovery. That's, that's important, especially you know if they're older, older children um, or spouses. You, you can have a long part of their declaration about how they've helped their wife through all of, all of this terrible um, trauma that she suffered and, and that the wife needs them to stay and to continue to help. Um, there are some special procedures for clients who have immigration history, negative immigration history. If there are simple grounds of inadmissibility or bad marks, you request the waiver on the Form I-192. If they have been previously deported, there's a couple of different kinds of deportations. There's a, an expedited removal, which happens at the border when people are coming in. In 1996, they changed the law so that the border officials would have the authority to deport, to deport people right there at the border. Um, and if your clients have those, then they will be automatically canceled when your U visa is approved, which is unlike our, our in the VAWA cases for the Violence Against Women Act, we can't even apply for our victims' residency because they have these expedited removals. And so it's a real hope that with VAWA 4, that's the next authorization of the law, that we're going to kind of streamline these two laws because it's completely unfair that the U visa applicants are able to, to get this benefit and the VAWA applicants aren't. We're spending a lot of our time doing backup, oh, we got to do a U for backup cases for U visas for VAWA applicants who are married to U.S. citizens and should, should have it at least as easy as the U visa applicants, but they don't. If the, if the victim was, has a final order of deportation or removal, then you can seek a joint motion to reopen and terminate. And in, if they're currently in removal proceedings, then you can do a motion to terminate. And this is, I'm not sure how this is around the whole country, but in LA, the chief counsel has been very generous in supporting motions to reopen and terminate for us. So the U visa, the U visa approved U visa victims really have um, a lot of special um, procedures that allow them to get rid of bad immigration history, which uh, a lot of other people in immigration don't have. And that's it. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Mm -hmm. The Mexican consulate's amazing. Um, at my office, we, we charge sliding scale fees based on income and family size. 
and for the very low clients, very low income clients, the Mexican the Mexican consulate will pay the entire fee. Um, we provide it, we prepare an application packet for them to go over to the consulate and the consulate sends us a check. And they're doing that for all Mexican nationals, which is a huge percentage of our clients. We're trying to liaise with the Guatemalan and El Salvadoran consulates to see if we can get a similar program set up. But yeah, the Mexican consulate's been amazing for us. They're doing it for VAWAs and special immigrant juvenile status, U visas. So it's great. It's it's wonderful. And we're trying. We haven't set the same thing up in San Francisco. We're trying to set the same thing up in San Francisco. We kind of have in LA. It's been going on for a while. The 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 program with the Mexican consulate. Um, and but we're trying to we're trying to branch out and, and work with other consulates in other cities as well. So it's the local consulate that you're, you're doing. The Los Angeles Mexican consulate is 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 providing huge sums of money to not just my agency but to agencies all around Los Angeles doing this kind of work. So I, I mean I would say hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. You can't go forward with the case. So you have to do everything you can to get that signed. And some cases, we have worked on two years to get a certification signed. And I, with this, I mentioned Santa Ana PD, I've been doing advocacy for eight, eight, nine months so far with the Santa Ana Police Department to try to get them to change their policy. So it's tough. I mean, you, the case is stopped. Cannot go forward. And you mentioned that the definition of agency is kind of broad, so do you find yourself looking for uh, uh, other agencies that might uh, have some ability to give that input if, say, local law enforcement doesn't? Well, it's, it's not that broad. It has to be an agency that has the authority to investigate or prosecute crimes. So CIS, they want to see, they want to see police, prosecutors, and we've had a lot, lot of luck with the Child Protective Services in, in Los Angeles. The, in San Francisco, we can't get Child Protective Services to sign, to sign the certifications. But in LA, we have a, we have a, great, a great person over there that, that's on board with it. Um, EEOC, I think we, we've only done one EEOC case. Um, and then the DHS, I've never heard of an ICE officer signing a U visa cert, but I, they could, I suppose. So it's not that broad. I mean, and it's not, there's, you know, we can't just be creative and get other people to sign. Well, I was just going to say, I can imagine a nightmare scenario where everything else is in place except the repositories of local law enforcement for maybe the worst of reasons. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate mm -hmm. that there's no mandate on the It is very unfortunate. It is very unfortunate. But you know what I've, I've found out? If you bug somebody enough, <laughs> then they're going to just sign it because their life is going to be easier because they're going to have you leave them alone. And so, it, and then, you know, you have the victim also. You tell the victim to go in there and, like, you know, be in their face. And then we're calling them on the phone. We're writing them letters. We're sending them PowerPoint presentations, you know. So sometimes they, we just wear them down. If the, the case that we're having is the woman was sexually harassed at work and sexually abused at work, and so the EEOC is allowed to sign that. So what typically happens to the abuser in these situations? Are they usually deported, or do they end up staying here? Well, the U visa has no effect on what happens to the abuser. Right, so outside of the the, the, criminal, the criminal law proceedings has, 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 takes care of him. And so it depends on, depends on what the criminal justice system does with him. The more serious um, incidences, they're arrested, prosecuted, convicted, incarcerated, and then deported. And there's a, there's a small problem with that because many of them come back in. 
and there's no criminal protective order in place to protect the victim because they say, oh, we deported him. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need a criminal protective order. Oh, yes, I do. But then the victim, if he does come back and harass him, the victim needs to go and get a civil restraining order against him. But deportation is not always, um, you know, continuing help or protection. No, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, the victim needs to go through the, the civil restraining order, family law, custody routes. Okay. We often help out the, with those situations. Like we provide, we do detailed declarations with every client, and we'll give that deck for them to, you know, to take to the restraining order to show to the family law judge um, so it can help the, enlighten them on what's going on and why the kids need to be with the mom. But there's nothing, there's no custody provision with, within the immigration law. And I'm assuming there aren't any presumptions that follow from immigration. There are no presumptions. Okay. Mm -hmm. If they're, do you mean if there's, they have a final deport order and they're here in the... Fortunately, no, but after the U visa is granted and they do have the final order, you need to go back into court and seek a joint motion to reopen and, and terminate. And like I said, in, in Los Angeles, the chief counsel is, is, is very on board doing that. Right, that's, a, that's an interesting, but that's a good project. Um, I guess you just have to carry your papers around with you and hope that ICE is going to understand them. And then if not, then you'll be able to contact your immigration counsel and they'll get you out. <laughs> It depends both on the agency and on the immigration service. Um, the one U visa case that we did have denied was because the police report said that the, the victim did not want to prosecute. And it was, you know, three words in the police report. And the victim, she, we tried to get fear, we tried to get everything out of her, come on, give it to us. But she, she said, no, I didn't want him to go to jail. I didn't want to, I didn't I didn't want the I didn't want the case to go forward and that's not who that's not who the U visa is for I'm, um, I understand with victims of domestic violence it's very complicated um, all the different factors that go into it but the U visa is really to to encourage um, prosecute prosecution investigation of these crimes is that it Opinion on why you thought it took seven years to regulate, or to promulgate regulations. 
<laughs> yeah, good question. Um, it was it was it was very difficult to do. I think they passed this law, and it was very difficult to make regulations for it. And the regulations are still vague in many places and imperfect. And we actually actually um, Peter Shea is an attorney in Los Angeles, and he filed a lawsuit against the government to, to force them to issue the regs. And so we finally got some regs, but the regs aren't perfect. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure in other laws if it, if it ever takes that long to, to make regulations for the law. The T-Visa, which is part of that same law, those regs were made right away. Um, but the U-Visa, it's kind of like they really didn't know what they were doing. Um, I know that's not very, <laughs> not a very educated response, but I think. Well, that's, I've, asked a lot, I've asked a lot of people, and no one is clearly, I don't really know. I've heard that part of it was because INS split into DHS after 9-11, and that doesn't really explain why two visas were so quick. And right, right. It caused a lot of. One thing I would say, too, is CIS is notorious for never issuing regulations on anything. They like to kind of regulate by memo. Mm -hmm. Send out like an inner office memo rather than send out regulations. So while it's egregious in the U case, you know, they as a agency just don't issue regulations, which is really frustrating in a lot of aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't even issue the policy memos sometimes. We're, we're undergoing something right now where they've they've said that the derivative children um, they're only issuing them visas. Um, until their 21st birthday. And you need to acquire three years of continuous presence after you have your visa to get your green card. So they're saying to these kids, oh, you can have a visa for two years and eight months, but then basically you lose. And they're also letting them bring in derivatives abroad for a two years, and then they're not going to be able to go forward. So their current, their, their current practice is bringing un, more undocumented people into the country, which doesn't seem to make sense. We do domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, Primarily, about 95% of the cases are DV and sexual assault, but they sometimes include other, you know, felonious assault can be um, domestic violence as well, assault with a deadly weapon. Um, kidnapping is also domestic violence. False imprisonment can be domestic violence. But we don't take many cases that are outside of that. We take child abuse cases, which we consider domestic violence. They created something called interim relief that allowed the victims to get a work permit while they waited for the regulations to come out. Um, and then when the regulations came out in 2007, there were numerous unforeseen problems um, with all those interim relief folks that they kind of had to develop different policies and still are developing different policies to work out what to do with those people. Mm -hmm. orders right? mm -hmm. custody, no. And so, I, so there are attorneys out there who are doing that and probably need to know about these options. How are, how are you getting those kinds of referrals or getting the information out to family law lawyers so that they know that these options are available? We're networked with, with most of the nonprofits in Los Angeles that provide the ancillary services that our victims would need. Um, the shelters, the family law agencies, um, we kind of all kind of all know about each other and that's where the whole stream of clients just moves around from one agency to another. And like I said, often we work with them, you know, I say, so we don't have to double do, you know, work. It's like, here's this declaration, you can use this for your, for your family law proceeding. Um, no, you can appeal. 
Um, just wasn't sure because we talked about how much discretion is vested uh, in the decision makers. I would imagine it would be uh, hard to get that decision reversed even if you got mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it depends on what your, what your issue is. Um, but this non-cooperation issue, they're, they're, they're pretty tough on it. All right, thanks.